Welcome to the Internet History Podcast. I'm your host, Brian McCullough. On today's episode, we're going to be discussing a story that is only tangentially internet and web related, but it's a fascinating technology history story, so I know you'll all love it. If you were a PC gamer in the 1980s, then chances are you're familiar with the company Sierra Online. They were the company that produced such legendary video game franchises as King's Quest, Space Quest, Police Quest, and, and even Leisure Suit Larry, and there were, there were more beyond those as well. Sierra is revered in gaming history, and one of its co-founders, Roberta Williams, is firmly in the pantheon of legendary game designers. I played Sierra games as a kid and have been keeping a separate file of Sierra facts and quotes and little nuggets that have come up in my research, just for my own personal interest, really. But then I was thrilled to be introduced via Twitter to Lane Nooney, an assistant professor of digital media in the School of Literature, Media, and Communications at Georgia Tech. Lane has spent the last several years researching the background and history of Sierra Online, And someday soon, hopefully, she will produce the definitive history of the company. You can find out more about what Lane does at lanenooney.com and on Twitter at Sierra underscore offline. Both of these should be in the show notes in your podcast app for this episode. Lane was kind enough to sit down for an episode just to outline, in a very surface way, of course, the whole Sierra Online story. And so that's what we have right now. Lane Nooney, and the history of Sierra Online. Lane Nooney, thanks for coming on the Internet History Podcast. Thanks for having me. So I, um, I'm a little intimidated because you're an actual historian and I just play one on the Internet. <laughs> I um, play one most of the time too. <laughs> okay, so I, I, hope, I hope I don't embarrass myself too much. Um, so I wanna, we're going to talk about Sierra Online today, and I'm going to start by explaining why, I, why we're doing this, because this is a little beyond web and internet history, but I'm interested in it, and it's my show. So, <laughs> um, But I grew up, like many, many people, playing these games, and um, I, I feel that they're central to the history of gaming and, and video games and things like that, and learning through your research, of course they are. Um, just as a small anecdote, the, one of the great um, uh, controversies of my childhood was the $160 bill that I rang up calling the Sierra Helpline <laughs> to get through, I believe it was Space Quest 2, there was a, um, a scene that was sort of like the shuttle pod landing on Endor kind of scene or something, if, whatever, it's been <laughs> so many years, but um, so you're, you're an assistant professor at uh, the at Georgia Institute of Technology, and and w- what what field are you working so in? So I was I was hired in as a uh, professor of digital media, mm. basically. So I teach. I mean, my my academic specialization is the history of uh, personal computing and video games. Mm-hmm. So I have my my within that my subspecialty is kind of the history of like microcomputing from the late seventies to the early nineties. So for those who don't know, microcomputer was. That was what we used to call what you would now call a personal computer because there was kind of a generational thing that happened. We had mainframes, we had mini computers, and then we had microcomputers because they worked on microprocessors. And these were the machines that would basically sit on top of you know, the desk or your kitchen table or some weird corner of your home because most homes didn't really know where to put them when they first came into the domestic space. Um, <clears throat> yeah, but um, so that's kind of where my sort of intellectual mm-hmm. audit is. And um, I'm assuming that uh, you similarly have uh, in your childhood a background at playing these games? I do, <clears throat> although if you had told me that 20 years later I would be trying to figure out how to write a dissertation about them mm-hmm. uh, when I was in graduate school, I would have never believed you. I actually spent quite a long time trying not to write a video game <laughs> history project because um, I just I didn't really care for a lot of the ways that video game history was written. Um, but yeah, so when I was a kid, I got my first computer probably around the age of 10 or 11. It was, it was a few generations old because it was a hand-me-down. Uh, my aunt's husband worked in computing 
and wound up giving me, I, want, I think it was a Tandy, but I really have so little recollection. And Sierra Games were some of the first games that we ever started with. Um, and so I grew up playing King's Quest, Quest for Glory. I remember when my computer's processor could no longer handle Conquest of Camelot, and mm. like I, I cried and cried and cried to my mother to get us a new computer, and she did somehow, magically. I think she wanted a new one too. Um, so I have, and that was kind of what led to the dissertation, was that I, I had these kind of weird, foggy, vestigial childhood memories of, of this, this woman named Roberta Williams, right, and these kind of bucolic uh, images of her, you know, in like these cable knit sweaters or, you know, sitting on rocks by a lake. That, that's the way all of the photography always framed Right, because yeah. they, um, they promoted her very heavily, yes. at least in the later years. I remember the boxes, like on the back of the box, yeah. it would, this is a, a Roberta Williams joint. <laughs> and Yeah, so by, so, and that starts kind of right around 1988 and kind of moves through the entire history that she's actually mm -hmm. there at the company. And so I remembered this kind of mythology about a woman who made her games at the kitchen table. Mm -hmm. And this was a, a, like a little too strange for me to let go of when I was a grad student. I got really fascinated by it and then that's what brought me into Sierra. So originally it began, my interest in this material began as kind of a, a women in computing or a kind of domestic culture of personal computing and that led me into all of the Sierra work. So let's let's get into the story of Sierra because it is essentially the story of Ken and Roberta Williams. Do we know much about um, their background and how they met or the, the marriage or anything like that? Yeah so they they kind of meet while they're in high school um, a lot of this ground gets covered. Uh, Stephen Levy wrote a very famous book called Hackers, and he wrote this in 1983, which was, the amazing thing is it's right before the video game crash. And so he's interviewing all of these people basically before their entire industry goes belly up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but they meet in high school, they're kind of, they marry, I believe, in 72. Um, by the time, by, they have, wind up having two kids together. Um, <clears throat> Ken went to, I believe he went to college part-time, uh, but got a background in computing. He was basically a mainframe programmer. That was what he was, and he worked at, uh, I believe, like an IBM kind of uh, uh, mainframe it, software developer. It sort of seemed like he was a consultant and he would float around with different... So he, I mean, it's very ha hazy. So he had some time of full-time employment, but he was also just taking on all of these freelance jobs in addition to that, um, because they were always trying to kind of spin into the next big thing, is my understanding. Um, Roberta, some accounts talk about her uh, flipping houses, that that's what she was doing, kind mm -hmm. of while Ken was, you know, away working on his programming. Um, but, you know, she did not have any particularly technical background. She was fairly wary of computers. Um, and they first came into their house in the form of a teletype machine, which is a piece of technology that uh, there's really no reason you would have ever seen one if you haven't gone to a computer museum, you know, at, 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 in the 21st century. Um, Teletype machines were, they were basically sort of internet terminals, if you want to think of them in, in a really simple, low-grade way. Uh, they had a, kind of a keyboard on them, they had a paper tape reel, they were extremely noisy. They had that really ratchety 1980s printer sound, but you could hook up to one with an acoustic coupler, which is basically using your telephone to hook into the internet. Um, if you've seen the movie War Games. Yes, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's that kind of, um, you know, phone freaking, right? It's that yeah. kind of old school technology. <clears throat> and Ken would do that basically so he could communicate with a mainframe terminal that he was working on. Uh, but while he was doing that, he would poke around the file systems on the, on the mainframes and he, found, he would find these games, right? And this was very common. This had been going on since the 1960s that basically people who worked at mainframe, uh, who worked on mainframes would often make and then disperse uh, these kind of personal amusements. Sometimes they wanted to test something out without writing a full program. Sometimes they really just wanted to entertain themselves. A lot of them were made by college kids. Um, and the, you know, he played games like Star Trek, which was a very popular one. Um, but the, the iconic one that Roberta got interested in was Colossal Cave Adventure. And if you've seen Halt and Catch Fire, this is a game that comes up in Halt and Catch Fire as well. It's considered to be the iconic or the er game of the text adventure genre. So actually we should we should go into that a little bit. So sure. this is before any kind of graphics. So essentially these text adventure games are literally text where they're describing you're walking into a room, you see a gun on the floor, do you pick it up? Yes, no, <laughs> right? Yes. So um, think of it as very compartmentalized, right? So 
You get a, a, a couple sentence description of whatever room you're in. You get some cardinal directions. Usually it'll tell you where exits are. You can go north, east, west, and you'll get a list of all the inventory items. And then you, you would type into the computer. You would tell the computer to pick up one of these items, and then you might use it to solve a puzzle or, or to kind of, kind of manipulate the environment in some important way later on in the game. Um, you know, mudding came out of this, which was basically text-based RPGs, mm -hmm. um, which still have a, a small but diligent fandom on the internet. You should Google them. Um, I've discussed them before because I was <laughs> in a Star Trek one when I was a kid, yes. Um, so, okay, so the, the, the game that we're talking about, this Ur game, um, Colossal Cave Adventure is the thing that hooks Roberta even though she's not kind of a computer person. Yeah, she, in, in early interviews, um, she'll say things like that she was very wary of computers. I mean, they were, you think about, you know, it's this large, noisy machine that gets brought into domestic space. Um, you know, her husband comes home from work. He's kind of totally obsessed with this object. And, and she, she makes some, some wry comments in some interviews where, where she's like, I just don't get it, right? Why do they just want to hang out with this thing? Um, and a lot of the stuff he was that Ken would play was very kind of statistical or numeric based, and then he stumbled upon this literary game, right? And that's the real transformation because Roberta was an ardent reader; she was always kind of uh, you know an avid storyteller as a child. And the game opens with this scene of um, you know you are standing at the edge of the woods in front of a white house. It's, it's something to that effect. And she sits down and she just starts communicating with it, right? Typing in responses, getting them back. Um, you know, spending, I think, the next month to two months kind of trying to figure out how to finish this game. She gets totally hooked. Mm -hmm. And so somehow this sparks in her head, um, we, should do a, we should do a game like this, but let's add the graphics. So what's, what's the thing that, uh, because if, if they don't have the graphics, what's the, is it bringing the Apple II into their house? Like, what's the thing that allows them to, to even conceive of that? Um, that's a great question. So it's a little hazy at some point. So Ken has, I've talked to Ken some. Um, he got very interested in microcomputers because, especially for guys who worked on mainframes, the, the real appeal of a microcomputer was suddenly you could control where that machine was, was um, storing data, right? Like you could, you could, old guys who programmed in assembly talk about getting close to the metal, right? And this is this kind of almost spiritual experience they talk about when I interview them. Um, that you were, that there was, there, there weren't all of these coding languages between you and the machine, uh, that there was just this very almost like primal one-to-one -one relationship you could have with a microcomputer that really wasn't possible on mainframes or mini computers as well. Um, and so Ken was really intrigued by these machines and he wanted one, he was trying to actually make business applications. That's what he thought he was gonna get rich doing, you know, making a Fortran compiler. That was what he wanted. Or create um, a, a VisiCalc or something. Yeah, 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 I'm not, it's not entirely sure what gave Roberta the idea to do pictures. I mean, one of the interesting things about Roberta is that she, she didn't really know enough about computing to know what you couldn't do. And that was both her, her kind of greatest strength and her greatest asset, um, because it meant that she had no preconceived notions. She was like, well, if there's a screen, right? Why can't we make a line, right? It's sort of that kind of, that kind of, um, that kind of attitude. And there were, there were very, very simple games that did things like that. She was probably familiar with arcade gaming, mm -hmm. right? So, so there would have been these other models of, of getting images to appear on a screen that she might, she was, you know, anyone from that time period would have been familiar with. Um, but yeah, so she she kind of, as I understand it, designs a game in secret. You know, hmm. she she doesn't she doesn't take it to Ken immediately. She sort of works it out in her head first. Um, and this is the game that becomes Mystery House, which is the first graph. It's, it's the first adventure game to have a graphical component. So are we assuming that she's drawing it out on paper and storyboarding it? Yes. It? Yeah. So is to the best of my knowledge. What she was doing is, is um, she brought Ken a stack of pictures, uh, actually, and then she kind of had this script in her head, uh, but, but the images were the really central thing. And so each picture was like a room in the house, right? And different things would happen there and you'd have to move through the different rooms in the house. Uh, it was, it, it's often been cited as, I mean, it's, it's narrative is very clearly inspired by uh, Agatha Christie's and then there were none 
uh, which is a kind of classic murder mystery where 10 people show up at a house and only one walks away alive sort of thing, uh, as well as games like Clue, right? So, so she is drawing on this kind of older tradition of like women's leisure reading um, and, and kind of like very typical kind of female domestic experiences. So I, I, I want to make clear so we can paint the picture in the audience's mind um, what Mystery House is, and when we, when we say drawings, we're talking black and white line drawings. Yes, it would be, it would, I mean, not even, it's not a, it's just a white line drawing, right? Right. Uh, or if your screen was... On a was, black screen. Yeah, or, or, or if your screen was green, green right? Sure, it was yeah. a green line. Um, yeah, it, I, I often describe them in my work as illustrations. That's an easier way of thinking of them. Right, because... As soon as you say graphics, you think they're interactive. Right, and so these are pictures that, that the user cannot manipulate. It's still essentially a text game where you have to type yes. in, go into the room, right? <laughs> yeah, it's like a, a picture book. Mm -hmm. um, and for in Mystery House, there was no fills, there was no color. Uh, it was, uh, they basically used a uh, kind of vector-based tablet uh, in order to create the pictures, and the pictures were just tracings of the stuff that Roberta herself had drawn. You know, it was really just a two-person operation. Um, and she, my understanding is she, you know, went to Ken and she really, really wanted to do it. And Ken was like, "Well, you know, all right, this this allows us to buy that Apple II, you mm. know, that I want, right?" Um, and I think he kind of did it. It's hard to tell. Uh, sort of, the accounts get very different depending on what period of time in Sierra's history they are telling this story they change it kind of manipulates right. them mm -hmm. uh, but essentially the game gets made right and and this is 1979 1980 yes yeah, so the game so I Roberta starts drafting this possibly as early as winter 1979 but the game predominantly gets made over a, a small period of months in early 1980 and one of the things that Ken had to do because Roberta right she doesn't she had done a little computing work at some point uh, for a job but she doesn't really understand programming lexicons, so Ken devises this system where he tells her to make a column of verbs and a column of nouns and a column for what they do so that she can write out essentially like, these are the words and this is the action they need to create. So basically he got her to kind of script a language for this game. And so do they? do you think that they form the company before they start selling the game or they're selling the game and it's a success so they form the company? It's hard to tell. So there was this idea, I think, that online systems was a kind of holdover from an idea Ken had had about having a, a company, I think, that's, that would sell what he would imagine is more kind of professional software. Uh, but once it sold, I think there was no doubt, right, that this, once they realized they could make a serious amount of money with this, I think there was no doubt that, that obviously this was the thing that they they wanted to capitalize on. It. It's it, they often tell it as if it was the thing they, they had been waiting for. They just didn't know it was going to come in this form. And they're initially just selling it uh, locally, going to stores and having them put them, put them on the shelves. And, and they sell 10,000 copies, which at the time is an insane success. So the way that they sell it first is actually through, um, they, post, they put an ad in a magazine called uh, Micro 6502, which is a microprocessor magazine. So if you can imagine like how how nerdy that clientele is, well, right? It's, it's extremely it, granular, It's right? in the days where they're still hobbyists. Yeah, yeah, right. it's, a, it's a total hobbyist magazine, so it's an extremely narrow market. They buy a one-page ad, the whole thing is all text, and there's a little order form that you would cut out of the magazine and you would write and you do your own tax, right? And you would mail it in with either a check or kind of cash on delivery. Uh, so a lot of their stuff was people either mailing in or calling in. And they did, have a, they did have a system of going around to computer stores and kind of acting as a small-time distributor. But essentially, those became kind of, and really are, two different industries. And so they, they actually kind of sold that part of their company to a friend, a guy named Bob Leff, who winds up starting SoftCell, which becomes the biggest uh, microcomputer distributor in, in America, basically. Um, and they focus on being a publisher. Mm -hmm. And um, mostly in games, right, at least or towards the end, but early on they're also a, d a distributor of other people's games. We'll, we'll get into that in a second. So um, the, uh, Mystery House is a big success, and so essentially the second game, The Wizard and the Princess, is just, okay, let's do one in color, right? <laughs> yeah, so they had actually, 
there had been a couple other, if you can find the old Mystery House ad, I've actually posted it on my blog, they have an, they actually sell it with another game, mm. uh, a small arcade game, because mm-hmm. I think Ken wanted it to seem like they were a bigger company than they were. So he, he kind of got these one-off uh, you know, titles that he could kind of bundle with Mystery House, which was this much more complicated project. Um, interestingly, the first thing that Ken does actually is he starts turning his tools into products. So he sells a uh, products called tablet graphics and paddle graphics, right? So he, he's, he's already made these routines that allow you to take what you've done on a tablet or using um, you know, uh, paddles, which are literally these kind of rotating controllers on an Apple to make graphics on a screen. He sells those as products, right? It's a very, um, it's a very kind of programmer thinking, I'm gonna turn a tool into a toy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they wind up coming, they, they kind of, and they sell those while they're kind of gearing up to make The Wizard and the Princess. And then that's Ken kind of digging deeper into how high-res graphics work on the Apple II so that he can actually produce color. Right, because the, the Apple II technically can only do what, like six colors? But if you screw around with the dithering, you can... Yeah. Uh, simulate other shades. Yeah, if you can get the, there's, I mean, it's it's such a phenomenally complicated endeavor. Um, I don't even really entirely technically understand it. I have to have, you know, guys who actually programmed it break it down for me. Um, but yeah, you could kind of shift the pixels uh, or shift their registers and, and get other kinds of colors out of the machine. Mm-hmm. So are, are they initially only targeting Apple II systems? When do they start to develop for other? It's dominantly Apple II for the early years, and that was kind of the, the way that the industry worked, is it was right. very hardware oriented. So you were an Apple II user, or you were a Commodore user, um, and it, it it's not even comparable to the kind of Apple versus Microsoft debates that we might have today. Um, you were investing, it's more like the Xbox, PlayStation, Kind of, kind of parallels, right? It's very hardware dependent. Except with a, a universe of thirty different. <laughs> yeah, or yeah. Except that, except that you had all of these machines. I mean, you know, yeah, you had like upwards of a dozen, possibly. Mm-hmm. You know, Atari had two different computers come out. You know, uh, Commodore had three in the span of like eight years. Um, and so they wind up. They start doing ports, I believe, about a year in, starting around 1981, I think is when they start hiring their first guys just to do ports, right? Because ports can take anywhere from, you know, three to six months, depending on the complexity of the game. And so Ken is just like paying guys to just churn these out, basically. Um, Don't they get a deal... I don't think with the the first IBM PC, but maybe with the PC Junior or something. So obviously we're in this era where by 1984, 1985, the PC paradigm takes over the industry standard uh, that IBM, you know, basically. Well, IBM tries, right? right? So so IBM wants to. IBM was the was the big mainframe company, right? And they also had the market on the um, on what actually we would call the personal computer. One of the things that it, it, you have. To, is good to keep in mind is that personal computers and home computers were actually two different markets at this time. Personal computers were for the office, mm-hmm. right? They were they were the personal version of a mini computer, if you could think of it that way. A home computer was the kind of computer you would bring into your home. It didn't need to be uh, as robust. It tended to lean more toward graphics because uh, there was an idea that it might be more about playing games, that kind of stuff on it. It didn't need to be running the hardcore business applications that uh, you know, uh, an executive might be interested I've in. I've said many times on this show, it's funny when you look at the old ads, how much it's about, um, you can store your recipes. <laughs> <laughs> how many times was that used as a selling point? Yeah, well, people were really trying to figure out how... Use cases. <laughs> yeah, how to... I, I like to think of it as that, you can read that as a symptom of people trying to live how to learn, learn how to live with computers, right? So you have this machine and you're trying to figure out what can I do with it, right? And so people are making all sorts of goofy stuff, right? They're making they're making software that will check your gas mileage and they or tell you when you need to, you know, take your car in for an oil change. They're they're also making recipe organizers. They're also making, uh, you know, kind of like games that are basically the you know uh, an electronic version of sex dice. Um, there's all of these strange use cases that people come up with. I think just because they're trying to learn how to live with these machines. It's this wonderful proliferation that happens in the early 80s that's, um, I guess, tells you something about people's dedication to, to, to learning how to bring these things inside their home. Um, to get back to the IBM question, so IBM wants to break into 
the personal computer market. And this was something that the early, the early like Apple II companies had been living in fear of for years because IBM had tons of money, right? They were, they were extremely well positioned. They had a large distributor network. I mean, this, these guys were the, the business end. And they all kind of knew that when IBM came knocking, IBM could knock them out of the running. The mistake that IBM makes is that they, they put all their money for a home computer behind this machine called the PC Junior. And the PC Junior was a disaster. Uh, the PC Junior was, it was super buggy. It had all these, it had, all, it had, it had a number of problems. One of the biggest being its keyboard, actually. It had a chiclet keyboard that was also wireless, uh, which actually caused more problems than it resolved. And the, the, the whole thing just flopped. So, you know, Ken was extremely savvy in that he was like, okay, there's this machine that's gonna go into every home, right? This is the IBM home computer. I'm gonna be making the kind of, you know, the software for it, right? I'm gonna be making, my company will be making the first games. They made a word processor for that machine. Uh, they made some arcade game, they, they ported over some arcade games like Crossfire for it. And man, that thing like just didn't move. I mean, they basically, it basically went out a bit. I think it, they wound up folding it, I think within two years. Mm -hmm. um, the, the real coup was actually the Tandy um, because you needed uh, King. So the, the game that they made for the IBM PC Junior was a game called King's Quest. And this is the famous, um, the famous game that, that kind of Sierra, I think it's best remembered for, at least in the US. Internationally, I think it's Leisure Suit Larry, mm -hmm. but. Uh, yeah, so King's Quest is the first animated adventure game. And what that means is it has what they would describe at the time as actually 3D graphics. It meant your avatar could walk around an object. And that it had actually never been done before. Um, you know, even in either kind of an arcade or a microcomputer setting, um, no one had ever figured out how to give it a sense of depth. Mm. Games were always flat. They were kind of existed in an or, X, or Y. Or top down. Yeah, yeah. Or the, you know, there was like isometric perspective. Mm -hmm. But this was a very peculiar thing where uh, they managed to build basically a game development environment that allowed, let's say, your avatar walks behind a tree, he will come out the other side, right? I mean, it was kind of a phenomenal technical feat uh, that, that, that you know, if you go back and read the reviews, like everyone was super impressed with how they did it. And uh, so at this point, the user or the player is manipulating the character like with cursors to move around the screen? With arrow keys or a joystick. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so, so King's Quest um, is, is the sort of big breakthrough. That's in 1984. Um, I, actually, this might be getting a little ahead of things, but I'm sort of curious if you would say that because they essentially create the, this franchise system. Then there's a King's Quest II, then they create other. Now, like that's common today that you know there's a Call of Duty franchise and things like that. But I, I get the sense that in the early video game industry, you might have Pac-Man and Ms. Pac-Man, but this sense that there's a, a continuing world and a continuing narrative, that might have been new. I would say, especially for computer games, that's true. I mean, I'm sure you could find precedents for it, uh -huh. small ones, but the kind of legacy we've seen out of King's Quest, right? An, an eight series game all done kind of under the wing of the same designer has, has, has kind of not been matched in some sense or would not have been matched until, you know, kind of the contemporary period. Um, that franchise system, and this is where I'm, I'm nosing around some of the, the kind of new work I'm doing on this. I really think the franchise system is a byproduct of the game engine. Because what the game, so, the development system that Sierra had was called AGI. It was called the Adventure Game Interpreter. And what it essentially, what it, its side effect was, and it's not clear if anyone knew this when they made it, but the side effect was that it allowed people who were not super talented programmers to make games. So this is actually the first moment in the history of games that we see kind of a division of labor, that, that um, systems programmers get to dis distinguish from applications programmers. And what it allowed for people to do, like Scott Murphy, right, who does Space Quest, um, he's not he's not a programmer, right? He was a he was a cook uh, working in Oakhurst before kind of Ken found him and 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 brought him in to work at the company. Um, it allows them it allows Ken to be able to find people locally and train them up just in AGI because mm. they don't actually need to understand 
well, what's making this pixel draw on the screen, right? That's the problem of the systems programmers. And they had three guys, Jeff Stephenson, Bob Heitman, and Chris Iden, who were the expert who kind of ran that show. And then it allowed them to fill their stock with these people who could basically just churn out um, variations on a theme, which are kind of what all of those games are. Police Quest, Quest for Glory, Space Quest, King's Quest. King's Quest was always the lead. That was often the game where they would take certain technological risks. Um, but then those, uh, whatever they learned from that would kind of waterfall down to the other game, to the other games as well. So Sierra is also a very unique company in that you have the case of there being, the designer is actually a role that is distinct from programming and that may not involve programming, right? And this goes back to Roberta herself. She did not program these games. Even, even though she was in a, an environment where you know, she could have learned this material if she wanted. That was not that was not the way she elected to go about her design process. To, to borrow a term from film, she's sort of the auteur, or you know, the the showrunner, as they would say in television, for for, for the King's Quest. That's scene. certainly how they wanted to frame her. Okay. Yes, yes. So, all right, let's tease this out a little bit more in in using these various franchises. So, are they are they thinking that of them as targeting specific audiences? Because, for example, like King's Quest is very sort of you know based on um, uh, fairy tale tropes. Um, so, is are they thinking? Okay, King's Quest is for kids. Maybe Police Quest is more for adults. Are they thinking in those terms at all? I think they are. Um, if you if you look at their catalogs, they often thematize like who in the family is playing what games, mm. you know, and, and and dad's playing Police Quest or he's playing Leisure Suit Larry, right? And let, let, we'll get playing. to Leisure Suit Larry in a um, second. Yeah. But I think the thing to keep in mind is that. I mean, really, the market was not that large, right? It was several hundred thousand people, but it was still just several hundred thousand people. You couldn't have, I mean, so their top sellers, King's Quest, right? They might label on the box that it had sold 500,000 copies, um, which, if you think about the installed base of computers, is a lot, but is also kind of not a lot, considering how much money it costs to produce these games. So what Sierra winds up falling into is actually they wind up just having Sierra fans. And so and Sierra fans will kind of play any, any what title. they want is a Sierra game, yeah, right? Yeah. And it becomes a bit less discriminate about, oh, well, I, you know, like, yeah, it, it's not quite target marketing. It's more like the company itself builds a brand and then people are very loyal to that brand. Um, I, I want to get to Leisure Suit Larry in a second, but... <laughs> On that note, let's let's talk about again the actual experience for the for the player. Um, it's it's very puzzle based, right? Um, you know, the reason I have to call into the one eight nine one nine hundred number is because I'm stuck in a thing, and these are brain puzzles, they're spatial puzzles, they're also math and you know clue based puzzles, things like that. Yeah. So a classic, um, the classic kind of adventure game style puzzle, and this is true regardless of, of you know who was making it is the kind of fetch quest puzzle right I need to get past the leprechauns that means I need to get act, you know I need to have brought a four-leaf clover with me right that I need to have picked from this patch in this other screen several screens so, passed I've yes. got to go back right and so it, it's you know I find an object in one place and then I utilize it somewhere else I need to kill Dracula that means I need to have found the wooden stake that's hiding inside the log you know, on the screen one south of where I, I initially mm -hmm. spawned, right? Um, and, and, and then Sierra also has these kind of spatial or navigation puzzles, right? So they would have these kind of um, puzzles that were very much about kind of, you know, if you think about the, the poisonous vines in Space Quest II, right? right there was a yeah. lot of that kind of stuff. That had a lot to do with their engine. Um, those kind of puzzles were really uh, only possible because of the way that the engine divided space in the game. And so you can think of those as moments where the, the game, the underlying platform is actually kind of creating some of the creative possibilities for the, for the play environment. Um, but there were like brain teasers and stuff, riddles right, where it would right. show up in these games as well, especially kind of Christy Marx's games. Yeah. So where, where does uh, the Leisure Suit Larry franchise fit into this? <laughs> Um, well, how far back do you want me to go? So Actually, go a little far back, because I, I did an episode on what I called the history of internet porn, which mm. I feel like even reading some of the things that I uncovered that you've done, I need to revise. <laughs> but so, yeah, go, go a little further back, yeah. So I've written a piece for The Atlantic on this um, called the, the Odd History of the First Erotic Computer Game. And 
So Sierra puts out this very famous uh, franchise series called Leisure Suit Larry. But the first Leisure Suit Larry was actually based on a text adventure Sierra had marketed in 1981. And so this happens, um, so this is, you know, you're getting really into the kind of early days of the computer industry, back when people would, you know, be selling games out of like shoeboxes at computer shows. So Ken's at a computer show in Boston. He meets this guy named Chuck Benton who had made this, erot this game that he called soft porn and he had made it basically to teach himself basic. Um, uh, and, and a lot of these games start this way, right? A programmer is trying to learn how to do a certain kind of maneuver, and so they just kind of wrap a game around it. And if you play it, you can sort of realize a lot of the stuff that's going on um, is kind of expressive of that. There's a lot of programming 101 tricks in that game. Uh, but it, it's basically about this kind of down-on-his-luck guy in his, you know, it's set sometime in like the, the 1970s. Uh, who who is trying to get laid, right? It's it's kind of the lowest common denominator of 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 you know sexual humor, um, and and that has a very kind of fetch quest mentality, right? It's you know, I I pres Chuck Benton, he'd probably been exposed to Colossal Cave Adventure. It's hard to name a guy in programming in the 1970s who hadn't seen Colossal Cave Adventure. It was that endemic. It was the game that everyone played. Um, so. So Sierra still held the rights to that game, right? So they, they, they bought the rights to it from Chuck, sold it. Um, it had a very famous advertisement that went with it that was uh, three women in a hot tub um, that was actually shot in Ken Roberta's home, right? This was the first kind of sexualized image of women in the history of computer gaming uh, that caused uh, quite a bit of um, an interesting array of conversation kind of sparked up around that. Um, but Sierra still had the IP, basically, for this idea. And I can't, I've, I, you know, I've had a, I think it was, it was, it was either Ken pitched it to Al Lowe or Al Lowe pitched it to Ken, and I can't remember which. Um, Al Lowe and I had a eight hour interview uh, over two days. Because <laughs> uh, he'd been at the company for so long. He starts in 82 or 83. Um, uh, kind of making uh, educational games for them. Actually, that's where he starts. He makes these kind of, you know, things like Bop a Bet. Um, you know, he makes the the Dark, uh, not Dark Crystal, Black Cauldron game for mm -hmm. them. Uh, he's one of the programmers on that. Uh, and they're kind of looking for something for Al to do. And you know, Al's a pretty serviceable programmer. He's got a good sense of humor. Uh, so he sort of pitches this Leisure Suit Larry game, and and that's when he really gives that the. The Avatar, who in the text game had really not really had a character in any sense, Al kind of brings it to life. He really draws out that loserish quality that Leisure Suit Larry has, uh, and yeah, they and 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 it's it's really easy, right? They, all it requires is the engine is the artist kind of spinning up new art for the game because the logic's already set. That game is pretty much a one-to-one -one graphical recreation of that text adventure. There's there's not a lot in there that is unique necessarily in terms of gameplay that Al produced. And so that becomes a whole series as well. Yes. And, and so for that, they have to consciously be, because I, I know we got it, someone handed us this, so it was clearly pirated, but for the retail market, they're consciously targeting this is adult material, right? Yeah, if you look at some of the old game boxes, I mean, they do... You know, I, I think they say things like may not be appropriate for children or, or you know, sh d prior to the early 90s, right, there were no regulations about this. You didn't have to, you know, they're, they're, they're uh, what is the governing body now that, that right, labels I, games? I don't know. Um, it's, I'm totally it's, I'm blanking on it. But, you know, they're, they're, you didn't have to stamp whether your game was rated for everyone or for a mature audience. Uh, you know, Sierra did a certain amount of responsibility of kind of labeling it as an adult phenomena. And they, I think they always like to claim that it was their, that they got more orders for hint books than they sold games. Mm. Um, but it was definitely one of their best sellers. And it, it had a very international, uh, it, it traveled well internationally. So, uh -huh. so I think it was one of their games where, you know, if a Sierra executive went to Japan, those other Japanese executives knew what it was, right? right there's right. accounts of it being played in London, um, as well as in the Middle East. Uh, yeah, it got around. <laughs> so um, with all these different franchises, um, is does Roberta have a hand in each of them, or is, is uh, King's Quest, is that series basically her ballad? Basically, King's Quest is hers. Um, 
each of the franchises had, or if you, you talk about the kind of, the franchise period at Sierra is actually quite short. It's about 85 to 90. And then there's a transformation that happens in the way the company is trying to organize its designers that's, that's fairly, we can talk about a bit later if you want. Um, but each of these, each of the franchises gets identified with kind of a certain designer persona. So there's Roberta Williams, right? The kind of domestic goddess of game design is how she sort of gets spun. Um, Space Quest becomes Scott Murphy and Mark Crow, and they they dress up in these these pig snouts and these glasses and these mohawks, right? And they call themselves the two guys from Andromeda. So whenever they pose for photos, they're dressed up. I like haven't this. thought of that in years, but I remember that. Yeah, go on. Police Quest was Jim Walls, um, and Jim Walls was a retired. Um, you know, he was, a, he was a retired California patrol officer, basically. He'd gotten shot in the knee. He, you know, they, uh, Ken found out about him. They were trying to push Jim into, you know, being retrained for some other job. And Ken pitched, well, why don't you come design games for us, right? And Jim never programmed, right? All he did was he knew police procedure. So Police Quest was kind of a, a weirdly ideal game because police procedure, it's all about following rules, right? Mm -hmm, so it mm -hmm. fits to a game system very easily. Quest for Glory, done by Lori, Lori and Corey Cole. Um, they were longtime like RPG Dungeons and Dragons types. Uh, you know, they would kind of be dressed up on the back of their game boxes. I'm trying to think if there's anything I'm, I'm missing. Those were the um, and Leisure Suit Larry Allo kind of performed the the sort of pervy uncle role, you know, at the company. Um, and and so they each had this sort of iconic. Uh, game designer kind of attached them. When Christy Marks came on board in the very late 80s, uh, she also had a similar sort of, um, you know, she, she made these uh, King Arthur and Robin Hood games and she had a very, uh, she would kind of do cosplay on the backs of her game boxes and stuff like that. Well, let's, let's see the, the story of the company out and then I want to cycle back to a couple, couple things. Um, so is it fair to say King's Quest V in 1990, that's sort of like the crowning achievement of this franchise era. I think it's the first game to sell 500,000 copies. I mean, I think I would, I would have to know on what terms you want to make that claim, mm -hmm. right? And okay. So this is where I become a, you know, um, maybe an I academic, mean, right? <laughs> maybe I mean in terms of the reputation to gaming history or the impact on gaming history. I mean, I think if you ask, Almost everyone will say that King's Quest VI is a better game than King's Quest V. Um, King's Quest V does do a number, right? It's that transition to 256. It's the, it's the, it's the King's Quest that comes out on CD. 256 colors. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, it is the transition from a what was a parser-based interface where you were typing in commands to a mouse-based interface. So now you just had a row of icons at the top of the screen and you would click on them and pull them down in order to interact with your environment. I mean, it was a beautiful game. It was also the first game they put out where, or the first of the King's Quest, where all the backgrounds had been painted. So, th so this is a, a kind of labor transformation that happens at the company. Prior to this, the, the backgrounds were being kind of done on the screens themselves. And uh, they hire in 1989 a guy named Bill Davis who had, who had uh, you know, kind of worked in uh, TV production and he becomes the creative director. And this is part of Sierra's push to make their games more like movies, uh, to kind of expand, I think, their, their vision of what they could be, right? They wanted to be the next Disney. They wanted to, they wanted to make these games cinematic. Didn't Ken say at one point, like, he's, he's read everything he could on Disney, the company, because that's what they were aspiring to be like? But most likely. I mean, he, yeah. he had very lofty ambitions about what they felt um, their... They're, that they wanted the, they wanted to transform the idea of multimedia entertainment. And so they they start running a bit more like a film studio at this point. And so they instead of everyone who's on a game working in the same room, they separate the programmers and all the artists um, into like separate rooms, right? So you're no longer working with your team. This winds up changing the kinds of dynamics of how these games are made. I, I interview lots of programmers and artists, and these are the things that they remember, right? These moments when they when when they have to start working in different parts of the office, right? Mm -hmm. or, or the communication problems that come up because they're not sitting next to the programmer they need to be talking to anymore. Now if they want to say something, they have to go, they have to talk to Bill Davis and he has to go over to the head of programming and right, there's like three more people in the chain. 
Um, and so it's this transformation of the organization of the yes, labor. Yeah. Yes, and that's a, a lot of what my, my work kind of um, tries to focus on because those, those are transformations that are happening in the video game industry at large. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, they bring in lots of actually like trained painters and artists and they, they paint these beautiful backgrounds. Many of the most memorable were, were done by uh, you know Andy Hoyos, who was kind of a you know a trained artist. A lot of these, Bill Davis was going down to the art schools in Long Beach and like picking up guys who who wanted to do an interesting combination of kind of classic media work along with um, you know digital work uh, and bringing them back up to Sierra. What this did was it bloated their bottom line enormously because you had to right suddenly you you needed twice as many people. And you needed them to have very, very specific skills, right? Uh, and so Sierra gets really kind of, uh, yeah, design heavy, right? They, they wind up bloating the design department a lot, um, which winds up causing them to lose a lot of money. Well, right, this, <laughs> is, this is, yeah. And this is jumping ahead as well, but like they even. Phantasmagoria is the first sort of live action. Ooh, what a mess that was. Yeah, I talked to one of the guys who was the assistant. Um, oh, God, what did he do? He was like the, the assistant lighting director or something. I think he had a couple different roles because people would can sort of drop like flies on, on that one. Um, yeah, Phantasmagoria was another case where yeah, it's a live action. It's a game that is basically live action video. So they have to build a soundstage, right? Hire actors. And one of the things to keep in mind is that all of this is going on in a town called Oakhurst, California. And Oakhurst is, um, you know, a lot of the other computer game companies are, are kind of in the Bay Area, in the Silicon Valley area, or they're in the Pacific Northwest. Oakhurst is really remote. It's it's 30 miles northeast of Fresno. Mm. If you can if you can kind of picture like, you know, the the uh, uh, geography of California. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you know and and. You know, Fresno is pretty out of its way as, as kind of the, the tech industry goes. You know, so this town is it's really, it's right, it's, it's about 30 miles south of the southern entrance to Yo the Yosemite Mountains, right? So this is not a place where it's easy to get programmer talent. It's e where, where, you, where you have an infrastructure, right, that can, that can handle these kinds of productions. It's not like if you were working in Silicon Valley, you just go rent a soundstage, right? They had to build one. Because um, also, you know, Sierra came into Oakhurst and they built some of the largest buildings in that town, right? It was a very small, they didn't even have a stop stoplight um, for years, even when the company had first moved in. Uh, and that, that's one of the things that leads to this very idiosyncratic pattern of just kind of hiring who's ever around, right? Like, why not make a cook a game designer, right? Because he's in the town, right? We don't have to... You know, for programmers, they often, and later for artists, they would go and kind of get people from other places. But there was a great amount of kind of hiring from the bottom up um, out of that town as well. So, <clears throat> so yeah, Phantasmagoria was this um, kind of monolith. No one knew how to do this, right? And so it, it became, it was much smoother when they did uh, Jane Jensen's uh, Gabriel Knight 2, The Beast Within, because they had kind of learned all of their lessons, but Phantasmagoria's budget, it ballooned, I believe, over a million. Don't quote me on that, but I think so. Um, and it was just, it was horribly, I think it was over time. Uh, it was a real, it was a real mess. <laughs> the two questions uh, about the company and, and the, the time that they're operating in. Um, so in the mid to later 80s is when you have the, the home gaming renaissance of Nintendo come around. Um, did they ever face pressure like within the market? Like, is PC gaming uh, threatened by you know the Nintendo Renaissance? I, th I think there was certainly. Well, so I think the way that Ken approached it was that a computer was a multi-purpose machine, right? And a console is not. Um, and a computer is a it is an interactive tool in a way that a console is not, right? So they really did get behind the idea that. Computers were interactive entertainment um, that that were also educational. They were family oriented. Uh, they the company had a real shakiness around consoles because they had gotten very burned in the video game crash of or the video game crash is what happens to the console industry. In in computer software, there's a similar event that happens about a year later called the software shakeout. Hmm. And this happens if the video game crash happens in like. So 82, 83, this happens 83, 84. It actually lags a year. But a whole bunch of the small microcomputer software producers wind up getting washed out of the industry. Um, 
you know, there were, uh, you know, people who had been like, com- you know, other companies that had come up with Sierra, companies like Sierra Software, right, which like, who's ever heard of that now, um, was a huge contender, right, very popular, just t- winds up trying to sell that, sell itself off in the pages of InfoWorld magazine. Uh, there were, there was a whole glut of magazines that kind of went out of business around this time too. And that was because Sierra had been, the, the particular risk Sierra took was that they had been making cartridges for home computers that took uh, cartridges. So the, it was uh, one of the Commodore and the Atari series. Yeah, yeah um, there's so many. I remember them. a Commodore I, that took cartridges, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and so they, they're, they're burning games for cartridges and the problem is that a floppy disk, one, the plastic in that costs 10 cents. The plastic in a cartridge costs like a buck 10. You have to sell the games for the same amount of money, so your profits decrease, and you can't reuse a cartridge. Once the ROM is flashed, you can't do anything with it. A floppy, you can take back, you can degauss it, you can print something else on it, right? Um, so if you can't sell these cartridges, because basically what happened in that time period was the Commodore 64 came out, it underpriced every other computer on the market, and a whole bunch of companies had placed these really, really large cartridge orders for computers that wound up not existing by the time Christmas came around. Uh, Johnny Mayer, who is, uh, has a website, um, he has a nice little blog called The Digital Antiquarian, he has a nice account of this event on, online there. Um, but, so this winds up actually almost wiping Sierra out. I mean, there's, It's it's I mean there's no internal documentation of the company but there's you know suddenly Ken and Roberta are charging everything to their personal credit cards Mm. Um, you know there a change in headcount maybe or a huge right so there's a mass you know so they drop from like over a hundred employees to like twenty and what year around is this Uh, this is like eighty three eighty four right and and basically the only thing they're feeding off of during this period is the IBM money for making King's Quest that is like one of the things that is keeping them afloat. Um, the venture capitalists don't want to touch them because there's been a market crash. Did they ever take venture money? Yes, they took venture capital as early as 1982, I believe. Huh. Um, and and so they were one of the first microcomputer software companies to take venture capital. And then they got more venture capital, I believe, in the mid 80s. And then they had an they had an IPO in 1989. Right. Um, but what happens when there's an industry crash is venture capital gets really wary, right? And so. Um, it, and I've gone through issues of the, one of the real benefits of, of that company being in a small town is that when they had these layoffs, that was news, right? So I've been able to go through on microfilm or by traveling to Oakhurst and going through their archives of the town paper, actual news reports, right? Written about, uh, you know, these massive layoffs Because this happened. is the company town or the t- Yes, yeah, I yeah. mean, they employed hundreds of people. They were, they were a huge tax generator. Uh, they were a huge employer. And so they, they kind of come out of it around 85, 86, but I don't think people realize that Sierra was in the red for like three years following that. I've talked with Ed Heimbuckle, who was their CFO, and he said he showed up and like, there was just, it looked like it'd been, it exploded, right? There was, there was no solvency in the company. Um, and he spent the next few years of his life kind of rebuilding that. And the, so the franchises were a reliable part of that system, right? That they, right. That, that you could always, you had, an, you had an engine that was, you know, pretty straightforward to program for. You didn't have to pay. Each designer didn't have to be a top programmer. Most of the designers were working on a fairly low percentage royalties, in fact. Um, and, that, and you're able to basically make a new game almost every 12 to 18 months, right? And so you pump out enough of those and that really helped buoy kind of their, you know, uh, the, the bottom line of Sierra. All right. Uh, similarly, let's go to the other end of the history. Um, in the 90s, when the web comes around, but even before that, when the online services like Prodigy and then later AOL come around and, and, and sort of rise to prominence, um, is that um, an, an, an impact on their sales and their business? Well, are you familiar with Sierra's own online uh, graphical gated right, community? Right, vaguely, right. So tell me about that. Yeah, go ahead. So this is one of the areas where I, I you know, I, I ha- I, I'm still learning kind of about the shape of this. But beginning in the early 80s, I want to say 89, Ken cooks up this idea um, that initially he wants to call Constant Companion. 
uh, for this, for this uh, he wants to take the game engine that they have and use this to, to produce a kind of online environment where people can go on and play games against each other. Um, one of the other contributing sets to this is, I, I don't know if you ever played Sierra's Hoyles games? No. Um, so they had a whole, they, and that was actually some of their most profitable, mm. where uh, it's, it's totally innocuous, but these games where you could play like cribbage and, and backgammon, and they had like, uh, I think th three of these? They were all programmed by, most of them were programmed by Warren Schwader. Um, they were highly reliable in terms of sales, but they, oft they also had this, they kind of prototyped this idea of like, okay, you're playing checkers against another character in the Sierra universe, right? And they wanted to take that and say, okay, well, how, could, how is it that I could play that game against, you know, we have, all the, we, have, we have all the logic routines for this game, right? How do we put that online right. so that my grandmother, right, can play someone else's grandmother, right, right over the internet? Well, because also in this time period, um, the BBSs that are sprouting up around the country are doing, and again, they're going back to text-based stuff, but they are doing interactive games where users can play against each other. Yes, and Sierra had a very strong BBS community. They wind up hiring actually a couple of producers out of the BBS community. Um, they had people who were assigned just to kind of provide hints and support uh, within the BBS community. They were very good at taking care of their fans. Um, uh, so... so so basically, they developed this thing called, initially called the Sierra Network, um, and it gets kind of rolled out in California dominantly. But it's it's I mean, the short story is that it was kind of before its time in that it was not really ever viable that this would be profitable. Mm -hmm. um, it was it was just a little too early. The infrastructure for getting the number of people you needed using it just wasn't really there. Um, so, you know, I interviewed a, a, a pair of people who actually met on and married, mm -hmm. uh, who met on, on the Sierra Network and got married and then worked for the Sierra Network. Um, it later got bought out by AT&T and its name was changed to the Imagination Network. And then eventually, I believe it was uh, picked up by AOL and they just mothballed it as competition, right? They kind of cannibalized it for parts and then the whole thing just disintegrated. But there was this kind of two, three, maybe four year kind of shiny period where, where you know, if you were a Sierra fan, this was kind of the, you know, the next best thing. Mm -hmm. And they would charge by the hour or? I believe so, you kind of, you, I think you would buy like a package. Okay. Um, but if you agreed to, let's say, be like a moderator or something, you would get free access. And right. that was how they, so they got a lot of their, um, a lot of their very most, most kind of enthusiastic uh, participants very common of, in that yeah, area. Yeah. yeah, went through that way. Uh, all right, so let's let's bring the the story of the company to a, a close, and then I want to cycle back to to Roberta. Um, so by like 1995, Sierra Online is doing 83 million in sales, um, net income of around 12 million, um, and so tell me the story of how they they get bought out for what at the time was a huge deal. And, and where where Sierra ended up in, in its corporate life. So most of my familiarity with this story right now is still coming th through interviews I'm having with people who went through it. So um, I'm kind of moving chronologically and I would say I'm probably somewhere in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, this is a part of, I think, a, a larger set of transformations that happened in the game industry that get really imminently complex. Like you really have to be a business historian to understand what's going on. But essentially, Sierra gets made a, um, it gets made, so it had had an IPO in 1989, and one of the people who had sat on Sierra's board was a man named Walter Forbes, no relation to the other Walter Forbes. Um, he ran a company called CUC International, which was kind of like a, um, it's hard to even explain what they did. Basically, they, they kind of franchised in selling coupon books to people. Um, this was, I don't, I, I was far too young to ever have any exposure to like what this is, but mm -hmm. uh, people would kind of subscribe and, and Forbes, CUC had been kind of cooking its own books for a while. So it made an offer on Sierra that was, that was based on valuations of its company that were not true. And it offered to buy out um, Sierra stock at a price well above what Sierra stock was running at, basically. And so, you know, the statement Ken has always had on this was like, I had to sell because I had a requirement to the stockholders. Fiduciary right? duty, right? Yeah, that that uh, to make them money. Um, 
And this is one of the, you know, the, the big transformations in the way the company begins to run is that as soon as it has an IPO, um, everything really changes. A lot of people have asked when, when Classic Sierra goes away and, and have identified it with when it moves to Seattle in 1993, people who work there identify it with the IPO because suddenly you have to turn a profit on the quarter, right? It isn't about, okay, we can bank till Christmas. Um, you know, things get, the belts get a lot tighter under that kind of, kind of system. And it, and it, but so, you know, Ken follows through on his fiduciary duty, right? Sells uh, the company, um, is involved for some period of time at a, at a kind of management layer. I mean, th this happens, uh, there's a buy-up of a couple other computer game companies at the same time, Davidson Software, for example. Um, but essentially, essentially at this point, Ken and Roberta begin to phase out. Basically, Roberta kind of wraps the final King's Quest Mask of Eternity, and and they they leave um, retire and, essentially. Yes, yeah. and they 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 get out basically right before the what are called the accounting irregularities get exposed. And so this it was the biggest embezzlement scandal prior to Enron. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the scandal of the 1990s. For um, for people that want to Google around about this or wiki wiki around it's um the Sendent corporation is the company that eventually conglomerizes into yes. and then has the scandal erupt yeah so running. so cuc buys sierra and a mm -hmm. number of other companies turns itself into sendent mm -hmm. and then this happens to send it um and so this is part of what makes all of this like the paper trail on this like extremely hard to follow because this kind of stuff doesn't happen in the 80s in the video game industry there's not a pattern for this kind of buying and selling and taking up of subsidiaries. Um, it's very unique to a kind of late capital moment in the video game industry. And when I talk to people who worked in the industries in the 90s, whether they worked at Sierra or Microsoft, they talk about this period where they did a lot of sitting on their hands because they, they just didn't, it was like, there's all, there's people who I talk to who, it seems like they spent their entire lives in the 90s starting game projects that never got finished. And that's just not the story you have in the 80s, right? Um, that basically if something was greenlit, it, it, it went into production, it got all the way through. I've never heard a story of someone whose game got mothballed halfway through, but that is consistently the story. That It's like the industry gets bigger than it knows how to manage or it knows how to self-manage, um, and there's all of this kind of fallout or during that learning process. Eventually, after, after the send it embezzlement scandal, um, the company gets bought or you know, kind of the remains of Sierra get bought by Havas, which is a French water company. Um, uh, you know, and eventually that is transitioned to or turns into Vivendi. Right. And then finally, Activision buys up the IP. Activision sits on the IP for nearly 15 years until they decide to very recently kind of resurrect the company as their boutique indie game wing, mm. uh, which happened about two and a half years ago. Uh, it actually got announced the week before I had to defend my dissertation, so I had written the conclusion <laughs> on my dissertation, and then I see this like thing fall across my Twitter feed, and I was just like, "Oh my God, you you have to be kidding me, right? <laughs> that this compute that this this company is is actually going to have like an afterlife that I have to deal with." Well, I, I just want to note also that um, they were publishers of some really prominent yes uh, late. 90s games like uh, Diablo Hellfire and um, Half, -Life Half Life on the PC. Um, I think uh, Lords of what did they do? Lords of Magic. They did um, a number. I can always age someone by what they remember Sierra for, right? right and yeah. people will talk to me about these games that came out in the late 2000s, and I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about, mm -hmm, right? Because mm -hmm. it, it's that period is. In some sense, they are no longer the company that they were, right? They're, I mean, they're they're a publisher manufacturing, or, you know, they're um, kind of handling the financing and distribution of these games that, in some senses, they don't even necessarily have a lot of, you know, a strong hand in, right? There was there was a lot more creative control that was happening at the company in the '80s and the early '90s than by the time it. It basically turns into just kind of this object that people are passing around, you know, that like executives are passing around at a table. Um, so, the the sense of what that company was had kind of disappeared. Well, let's let's finish up by um, going back to Roberta because you've done a lot of work on her, um, and we've already talked about how I want to talk about her her role in the video game history. 
um, and her place in, in the history. We've already talked about how she, she wasn't uh, a programmer. She comes more from a literary tradition than what we would think of as a hacker tradition for all the, the puffery of that, of that <laughs> word. Um, but Roberta self-identifies as a storyteller more than anything else. Yes. And so um, is, that, is that part of her legacy in bringing this sort of storytelling more than the game mechanisms thing? I mean, I think that her legacy is a very... As a historian, I always speak reflexively. So I'm interested in, like, why do we position certain people in the ways that we do when we talk of them historically? Um, when it comes to Roberta Williams, people really want to kind of remember her as the female, uh, as the woman of game history. Um, and I've, I've been more curious about, like, why and then what, what consequence does that have? And then in, like, her material legacy. I mean, there are things that... Um, you know, certainly the idea that she did have, she did seem to favor games that had female protagonists, uh, did have an impact on specific game designers. You know, Brenda Romero has told me stories about playing, I think, King's Quest VII, which was um, Queen Valenice and the daughter Rosella, um, and that, that having a, playing an adventure game with two female protagonists was really um, transformative, or, or it made you feel like you, you, were, you were engaging in something you'd never seen before. Um, the literary culture of games, I think, had always had many participants, right? Infocom was a strong proponent of that. Um, you know, LucasArts with the Monkey Island series. Um, but Sierra was definitely a herald. Uh, so, you know, her, her legacy tends to be more in the role of how we want to remember her, I think. Than well, you've, you've written that video game history doesn't know how to make sense of her except yes. to single her out. Yes. Okay. And so often, right, there were actually many female game designers who worked at Sierra, none of whom ever get talked about, kind of because, because people, it's easier to allow Roberta to kind of um, be the only one we bother with than it is to understand, well, what was really going on that like all of these women were participating in this? I think one of the reasons this was able to happen at Sierra, again, was because there was not, they had, they had already broken that relationship between designer and programmer. So that's why Christy Marx is able to come in and make games. That's why Jane Jensen is able to come in and make games. That's why Lorianne Cole is able to come in and make games. None of them program, right? Um, but they do have a background in, in storytelling. Um, you know, Jane had always been a writer. Christy Marx was the, you know, she was the, the kind of idea chief behind Gem and the Hologram. She had worked in animation and she had worked in comic books for a long time. Sierra was a place that fostered that, right? Mm. It, was, it was an environment that was very unique for that reason um, because they were willing to, because they had art, there was such a template for that split in the figure of Roberta herself, right? And so I think if there's something really worth centering in on, it's, it's that division, right? That she kind of, that, that has to happen in order for her to be able to continue to be uh, one of the game designers at this company. Is there uh, another interesting thing is is that you know from from their internal records that they believed that thirty to forty percent of their player base was female. This is based on um, a very specific piece of information. So so w one great thing to know is Sierra didn't keep any internal records. Um, it's one of the things that one of the reasons a lot of my work has become oral history is because. Um, there are no budgets, org charts, documents, memorandum, right? Ken didn't keep any of it, uh, which makes a historian's work <laughs> very difficult. So for future game designers uh, or, you know, anyone in tech, um, that kind of material is actually more important than any of the, you know, for a historian, it's actually more important than the programs you make, right? Because it, it allows me to understand about, like, how did your company operate? What were the, what the, what were the core tensions that existed? Mm -hmm. um, rather than just what were your products? Right? I mean, um, you can't tell a behind the scenes story with just like an assembly of products. And I think a lot of video game history has, has kind of suffered from thinking that all that game history is, is an assemblage of, of, of dates and names of like this came out then and then this came out then and marking transformations from game to game, but having almost no idea what's actually happening in the industry itself. I, 
I'm, I'm going to end with, with that idea because this is almost, I'm asking you personally for this because <laughs> um, you've said that like game history is largely concerned with like the chronology of titles, but also the chronology of objects. Um, and like for, for my own interest, like what does that say about the larger t tech history or the job of a te tech historian? So it's not just a fetish fetishization of this gadget and that gadget. Um, what are, a lot of your work is trying to find out what else might count yes. in telling tech history. So just in a broad sense, even beyond games, um, what, what do you think about that? Um, so I often, people are, can get surprised when they initially talk to me because they think I do this because I'm a fan mm. or because I like love Sierra games. It's like, yes, I played them as a child. I have a certain affection for them, um, but I don't. I don't do it because I love, I think that, I, I think that it's, one of the strange things is when you, you see these fan communities often kind of just ask the same questions over and over and over again. And there's such a, it's like they can't even imagine what else might be part of these histories, right? I, I want to think about, I want a history that doesn't lead me back to games. I want a history that leads me somewhere else. I want a history that, that relates this to, to politics, to geography, and to, Technolo technological and economic transformation. I mean, the history of Sierra is, it's the history of, of, of transformations in technology and domestic space. It's a, it's a history of like kind of late capital, right? It's a history of the transnationalization of, of digital industries. Um, all of those histories are, are shot through the Sierra story. But when all we want to talk about is King's Quest, we're not really getting anywhere. And in that sense, we're selling ourselves short, right? We, we're not imagining that there could be, um, we're continuing to, to truck in the trivial. And, and we're not really understanding that if we do want to make a case that, that games are important, we actually have to imagine on these bigger scales, right? That um, the nostalgic gaze is not the only one or should certainly not be the one that kind of governs how our history gets organized. Um, Lane, thank you so much for, <laughs> For, I wanted to hear the Sierra story, but also thank you for um, giving me another perspective on, on how to do tech history. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. My job, too. If this is the first time you're listening to this podcast, please subscribe to us on your podcast app of choice. There's plenty more great internet history where that came from. And if you're a longtime listener, then you know what to do to help us out. Rate and review us on iTunes, because iTunes gives credit to reviews and ratings, and the more great reviews we get, the more people will discover us. As always, there's more info on our website, www.internethistorypodcast.com. The show's Twitter handle is at NetHistoryPod, and my personal Twitter is at BrianMCC. Thanks for listening.